trying to do. Evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, this little um, little talk on uh, the making of Fury Road, the, ma the, the first uh, Mad Max for tw over 25 years since Thunderdome. Um, it's got a, an incredible history, I've got to say, and I, I, I must confess I do have to read it out uh, because of that. But it was on and off for quite a number of years, quite a number of years, actually. Um, and this, this gives you a quick idea. In 1999, scripting and storyboard, storyboarding commenced. So that's, that's the start of it. 2000 and 2001, they surveyed Australia, Tunisia, Morocco, Mexico, Chile, UAE, Jordan, Argentina, South Africa and Namibia, looking for locations. George was adamant he didn't want a blade of grass. Didn't want a blade of grass. And uh, 2002, was an April survey of Namibia with George and aimed for a March 2003 shoot. September, they started prep in, in Namibia. They actually started there. 2003, February, shut down due to the Gulf War uh, and various other uh, reasons that were probably exacerbated by that. Um, 2000, now, there's six years go by, and I think George might have done a pig film, he might have done a <laughs> penguin film or something. February relaunched develop, and developed a 3D system. This is where it gets, starts to get very interesting. May, shoot 3D tests with uh, SI 2K camera system. February, shoot first 3D test with the Paul Nicola prototype. So Paul Nicola, a technician cameraman in Sydney, was building a 3D camera. There it is, uh, from scratch. Um, and I'll just finish this before we go into that. 2010, October, road test, Paul Nicola 3D camera rigs in Broken Hills, shut down for a February re relaunch. It gets delayed due to Broken Hill weather and turning green. They had so much rain out there. They had wildflowers up to here. They drove into town and found three old geezers outside a pub and said, when is that desert going to go back to red earth? And they said, we don't know. We've never seen it that deep. So. March 2011, March Happy Feet 2 used Paul Nicola's 3D camera system to shoot the live action portion of that film. And then 2011, June relaunch, Survey Namibia, November, switched to ARRI 2D. And then 2012, we shot in Namibia, 2013, shot in Australia, 2015 release. So that's the, that's the timeline of, um, of Mad Max. So up to the point that I, I came on board, Dean Semler, the, the great Dean Semler, was always Mad Max. Um, and he was there and, and doing the tests, as you can see from those Sorry. stills, um, in the desert and with Paul Nicola in Sydney as they built this, this 3D camera. Now, coming up, coming up. The 3D camera, um, George is, is a very interesting, extremely interesting visual uh, director. He knows what he wants and, and, and will set out to get it. Now, 50 to 60 per cent of Mad Max Fury Road is, is inside the cab of a truck. And one of his criteria was that he needed a 3D camera that could fit through the window. And there wasn't one around at that stage. They were all half a Volkswagen that, that would never have got what he wanted as far as physically moving the camera in and out was concerned. So it had to have that. It also had to have moisture proof, dust proof for desert work and whatever, um, and be obviously as small as possible, but also um, offer the data to the backroom boys at the end of the film for his massive uh, post, which George is renowned for and spends a lot of time and, and is very pedantic in the intricacies of that um, post work. So they, Paul started building this incredible uh, machine with these demands and, and I, I firmly will say that in the three years of the building right up to when I became involved, I think about two years in this damn thing was probably state of the art in the world as far as 3D was concerned. It might have been the smallest one. Um, 
There were a few other criteria. George uh, had heard enough about 3D to know that uh, the alignments can go out and the mirrors give problems. And well, you know, those of you who know 3D will know all the problems with that. George didn't want any of that. He didn't want to be delayed on the set by standard 3D problems. And they, they had to try and solve that. One of them was this alignment thing where somebody comes out of a, out of a little hut and raises their hands and says, stop, realignment, hour and a half. And uh, he didn't want that. So they said, well, do you want to watch your uh, monitor in 3D or 2D? And he said, why? And they said, well, if you do it 2D, we'll give you one eye uh, to watch. And uh, you'll just see it in 2D. And, and we can realign it later in post. He said, do that. So there were a whole lot of things that George wanted to shortcut but get a 3D result. So all of this was developed. And, the massive work that went into it, there was um, the, the situation also was that uh, he didn't want to change lenses because then you've got to open things up in a desert and with sand and whatnot and, and put lenses in and then you've got to realign everything and make sure everything's aligned pr correctly. <coughs> so they were literally building a camera chassis and, and uh, housing for each lens. So you, sh you change the entire camera. Um, and they were small, a uh, little heavy, but small. Uh, but that was all, again, part of the criteria. Um, this then meant that the grip boys started developing systems that would enable this camera to be basically handheld because, you know, um, you'd have to be Arnie Schwarzenegger in his prime to carry this thing for any, any time at all. Uh, so they had a, they, Grippos were developing a hanging system, a grid system above the truck that fitted on top of, of the cabin of the truck. And there were three trucks, identical trucks made, um, and it would fit on all of those three, just a forklift truck would come in and lower it on, clip it, and away, away they'd go. They could then hang this thing through the sunroof, the, the truck had a sunroof, and they could hang it on a, on a system of, of piping, uh, uh, block and tackle system um, to the height they wanted with the adjustments and they could lower it down to the height they wanted and they put it on a very heavy bungee so that it had a, a softening movement. So when you're actually travelling in the truck, you had, uh, uh, you're able to take shocks out of it and shock movements out of it. It also created uh, what we found later was a lovely... Um, kind of travelling mo mo movement with the cameras. Um, so all of that was being developed. But, but when I arrived, uh, they'd done these tests out in Broken Hill um, and also uh, they built a, a quick plywood mock-up of the size and replica size of the cab of the truck and they put the five uh, wives in the back um, and drivers and passengers in the front and promptly started to make this thing try to record what George wanted. But also, uh, Dean was obviously testing the lighting for it. Now, the, 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 the guts of this thing was the Dulce chip, which is a military uh, camera uh, from America, which they, they built, I believe, for military reasons, military recordings. It was a global shutter, it was 4K res. Um, but, and they tried to build then a housing for it to go into the movie business. But somehow it didn't work. Uh, people didn't pick it up. It was either too big or whatever. And so they dumped all that and, and uh, Kennedy Miller Mitchell bought the lot and, and built then these cameras around that chip. So they had a pretty good chip. But coming on board, it, it, it uh, was a little bit nerve-wracking. It sounded exciting. Mad Max, Fury Road, Dean... Dean was leaving very amicably for his reasons and, uh, and I'd worked with George before so I got the phone call and away I went. I thought, yep, I'll do that. But then walked into this brick wall of digital 3D um, development and when I watched Dean's tests and, and as, as a great cameraman, Dean did his tests very, very well and whatnot but I suddenly realised that the limitations to the camera in recording the contrast ratios that were required between the interior of a truck, quite a dark truck, as you can see, the whole damn thing's black, 
and the hot, bright exterior of a Namibian desert um, was stretching the boundaries a little bit. And Dean was muttering and going on about how I think it's only got five stops latitude. And I thought, what? Okay, you're dying, dying here. Plus um, the fact that G George's theory, this is where he's, he's fantastic in his, in his visual thinking, wanted to shoot the whole film with one camera. Like one camera would do every shot. You wouldn't do multiple cameras. It was like one camera would do the shots. Well, um, I backed up against that mentally, just quietly within my own, because I've been doing multiple cameras and loving it for the last 15 years. And, and uh, I thought, oh, no, you can't make Mad Max with one camera. Of course, that's ridiculous. So, um, the, but then the size of this thing, you couldn't get three of them inside the truck and seven people. So um, all of these things were starting to come down. I'm thinking, I, think I know why Dean's leaving. I don't know. He's, he's out of here. So in the mock-up, I went along there and, and, uh, and we saw, I saw the mock-up. Then I went up and saw the tests and died because Dean was using, having to use, to balance to the exterior, quite large Fresnel lamps, hard, straight in. And with five beautiful girls in the back seat, um, and they, was, they shot with models, stand-ins, uh, they weren't looking real good. Uh, that light was so strong and directional and contrasty and, it, it, and the shadows from the, where the HMIs couldn't reach, um, couldn't come low enough because they'd be in shot through the windows, um, were awful. Uh, also the fact that he was using obviously uh, HMIs on stands around to do the test, which is fair enough. But all I thought, how the heck are we going to hang that amount of light uh, off the grid, off the, the rig on top of the truck and down and into the truck and be able to finesse it? So I, I took to the drink a little bit about that. <laughs> um, but then slowly, like as everybody is known to, to do in the industry, you, you girded your loins and accepted the challenge, you've signed the thing and away you go, you're going to make it work. So we set out to make it work. And we were doing our tests on the cameras and the usual, getting those cameras finessed down to um, good usable cameras that, that wouldn't fail in any way or have any sort of um, funny little problems that might occur. We tried to think and we're getting stuck into it. Dean had, had left and gone and uh, away we went. But in the conference room up there at George's office, uh, I think it was a Friday night, we had a meeting and he went round the circle of all the heads of department there and what problems have you got, what problems have you got? And he got to me and he said, what are you doing, Johnny, with the thing? And I said, oh, I'm just gonna test, uh, Monday we'll start testing some Ross Grimm and gels to put over the windows. You, you can't do that, Johnny. And I went, uh oh. And he said, no, no, he said, there's people. I hadn't read a script, there was no script. Um, <laughs> he said, he said there's, there's people coming through the windows, there's people going out of the windows, there's guns coming in and out, of, there's hand grenades, and there's, this is all top secret, what I tell you. Um, hand grenades coming in, you can't have anything over the windows. And I thought, oh God. So I thought, uh, I said, oh, just horse of course, George, testing everything. So that I feel and hope that when we get out there in the desert, if I can use them and they help, I know that they won't moray or they won't do whatever, you know, and even thing, thing. And, oh, he said, oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, okay, okay. So then uh, the next Monday morning, there was another meeting. Every Monday morning, there was always a meeting. And uh, George shattered everybody, shattered them. He just walked in, sat down, and he said, we're going 2D. And that threw away three years of Paul Nicola's wonderful work. Um, a lot of money, I think, um, threw it all out and uh, he turned to me and he said, uh, we're going to go 2D, Johnny, what cameras are you going to use? Well, I mean, uh, it was my first digital film, I wasn't too sure, I'd read a little bit about it. <laughs> and having been a Panavision man all my life, I said, well, George, I'll ring Panavision, find out what they've got. And uh, somebody said, they've got Lexus, a Lexus. I said, we're using a Lexus, George. <laughs> 
And so we did. But I, I already knew that Alexas were um, proving amongst the guys to be a very compatible camera for, uh, for uh, feature film shooting. So we swung over to that. And George is wonderful. He, he's, he, he, he said to me later in the day, he said, Johnny, isn't it great we're liberated? And I thought, yes, we are in a way, you know, because the limitations of that great big 3D camera um, would have stifled us down. It would have maybe, maybe slowed us up even more than we did go. Um, you're showing those too early. No, come over. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it might have stifled us. We were now, we were free now. We had much smaller cameras and we were lucky to be able to acquire um, four of the uh, Arri M's, um, which are quite very small camera, um, and uh, get four of those off, off Skyfall from uh, Roger Deakins' Bond film. And uh, we made good use of those. What we did then was continue, though, obviously, the hanging thing because, you know, it's pretty hard work for an old man to hold one of those, even the M with, with small lenses on it. You can't hold it all day. Um, so we kept this bungee system, suspension system going. And the grip boys did a, a great job. And we reduced it down and reduced it down. It was still fairly large gear when we went to finally shipped everything to Namibia. Um, uh, but we were still using the platforms on top of the cab. But very quickly I realised out there that the shadows from that, with everybody climbing in and out of windows on this, on this uh, war rig, that uh, you, know, you can see there, as soon as somebody stuck their head out this side, they had shadow city of bars and pipes and scaffolding and, and um, baseball hats uh, all over them. So. Slowly, we just got rid of it all and, and reduced it down until in the end you'll see some stills there where basically we just handheld LED lights and within the cab or outside. Um, you can see the platforms the boys built. We'd roar around the desert at 80 kilometres an hour with all on those platforms. Or basically 60% of the movie is sim traffic. The truck's not even moving, the vehicles aren't moving. Um, George and Dean, I think, have, I have to be honest, pioneered that Simtrav uh, technique on the earlier Mad Max films and, and did a wonderful job, you know, of convincing people that trucks were actually moving and they're not. Um, with all the, with the, the budget uh, they had, it was found, you can't see it quite here, but the whole truck prime mover is raised up on... on, uh, on um, what do you call them? Bloody airbags. Okay, airbags. Um, <laughs> on airbags, and then boys would sit there with these steering wheels, and they could bounce it up and down, and you know they could go fore and aft, and they could go sideways, and the whole truck just shook and went on, and you know you could you could almost throw people off it uh, with the movement that they could get out of those airbags. So a lot of the vehicles were all set up. Uh, for that, and that enabled then the SimTrav to be extremely good. They didn't do the back of the, the thing, but that's okay. They just did the prime movers. Uh, George, George, knowing and having done SimTrav a lot, knew that the, basically the use of elements is, is essential. And wind machines, big wind machines would be on either side, pouring wind and sand in, into the... Um, into the set, so the hair and everything is blowing and going on, and it all gives that feeling of movement. He doesn't overdo it, he doesn't underdo it, he overdoes it. Because he knows that, you know, on film, you're going to, it'll look less than it actually is to us. Um, so he overdoes it, and it always looks, looks damn good. He um, is also very uh, adamant and pedantic about frame rates. Um, I don't think there's a single shot in the film that's over 24 frames. It's all under. Um, and he's very, very pedantic in post as to how fast that shot should be. Uh, I've heard him sort of saying, show me seven frames speed rate again. Uh, okay, make it six, five. Oh, I like the six. So he's juggling one frame rate 
difference. Um, his theory is, uh, and there's a couple of theories, and I, I might do them now, is, is, that, is that his one camera thing uh, is something that he obviously read about. He said, you know, I've read that there's certain directors around the world that feel that the perfect coverage of a scene can be handled by one camera. Um, my theory is if you use multiple cameras that the camera the editor uses was in the perfect spot. So they could, you could have six of them and use all six and they're all in the perfect spot if the editor uses them. But he... Um, <sighs> I'm a bit naughty. I, I wanted to shoot multiple cameras, so I put them in anyway. And, um, and it was an interesting little mental teeter uh, um, teet. We had occasionally, you know, about multiple cameras. And um, he had this uh, fantastically unnerving habit of he set up A camera, which was the camera that was going to do the scene. Uh, and then B camera would be possibly cross shooting there. And, Another one would be on a full profile over there. Um, that you, you suddenly found that he'd suddenly look at and he'd see, what's that camera there? And they'd say, oh, that's, that's AJ's camera. He's on a 45 degree cross, cross thing. Oh yeah, AJ. And we're all on George Radio uh, comms. And uh, he'd say, AJ, move your camera left a little bit. Left a little, a little more, a little more. Until clunk, <laughs> it hit the A camera. And then C camera would go, come shifting across and go clunk and hit B camera. And I used to sit there and I'd think, ah, oh, George, you've got three cameras shooting exactly the same angle and the same size. Um, so that wasn't going to work. So in all essence, I'll be naughty and say that I often pulled the plug out of mine so I wasn't up on the monitor board so that I could, I could cheat in what I thought was an angle that was productive for it. Um, that could almost be an example of it there, you know, I'll get another one in beside. We just jammed in. So you can, see, you can see the sliding rig up there, all the three cameras are on the rig up there. It, it's sailor gear, it's piping with the sail track and it's got the uh, slide cars from uh, yachts and it was a fantastic system. And we just clip in up there, as you can see it's a bungee lead, once again on yacht block systems with a, with a uh, little uh, locking cleat on the end of it. So at any time you could just quickly unlock that and just drop the camera down to there and find where you wanted the middle of your, your bungee travel. Um, and you could also then slide up and down and up and push force against <coughs> the bungee and do quite good movements in the truck. Obviously the truck, all the doors came off and you could poke a little thing. What happened now, I'll go back a little bit to pre-production because on the swing over to 2D, um, we ended up with 11, wasn't it? 11. 11 Alexas, Alexas. Um, between the two units, in fact. Um, we sent Ricky Schamberg, the first AD, uh, first AC, uh, who was on the film with Dean right from the word go, and a girl that I brought on called Michelle Pizanis, who um, I'd done quite a few films in Europe and, and uh, America with. And, she was an Australian, a big, lovely Greek Australian girl. Desperately wanted to get into the industry uh, quite a number of years ago, and she, she did what I tell all students to do: is get onto a cameraman and bug him until you give him a job. So I gave her the job, and I, I think uh, never looked back. She's fantastic, and we actually got her uh, earlier on uh, that thing I did in Morocco, Prince of Persia, um, as a as a more of a camera coordinator. Um, when she came on, uh, I said, look, I'd love to take you on on a movie, but you need to offer something. You need to offer, be able to do something, for God's sake, you know. And I said, look, I'll ring Panavision, go to Panavision. They're a great team. And go there and, and ask them to, if you can go through all the equipment, find out what's in a box, why that does that, what plugs into there, why. Learn all that, then you're useful. And that's a very simple thing to do. Panavision, don't mind. She was there for three months and I think in the end she ended up running the place. Um, she later went to America and she ended up running Panavision America. Um, but she knew all the equipment and it was fantastic to see her working in, in uh, Europe on, on Prince of Persia or in uh, Venice on the tourist that uh, 
she knew more about the equipment than most of the ACs because in, in, in Venice on the tourist, I was using Panaflex gear, which I always use. Um, they always used ARRI, so they weren't too au fait with Panavision gear, but she was, and she'd say, no, 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 the blue thing goes into there and there. She was right on top of the whole thing. On this one, she organised everything, and Ricky Schamberg and the first ACs who normally have to take that as part of their burden uh, of organising extra equipment in from South Africa or London or wherever we were getting it from, Sydney, um, she organised it and left the boys to do their job and, and they just liaised with her and made sure that every, everything was going well. Uh, the lovely Charlize Theron there in the middle uh, decided we were a mob of wimps. <laughs> and uh, because they, they were, the, all the girls were in practically nothing, although they were very skimpy sort of things. And uh, we were all dressed up looking like Amundsen of the Arctic. And, she all said we were wimps. She's a fairly earthy woman and uh, we were definitely wimps. So uh, Michelle, of course, raced out and immediately got T-shirts made. And, and uh, Charlie's loved all that. Um, and don't forget, any questions, please, as we go, rather than saving them up at the end at all, you know, other people want to hear uh, any questions that you can, you can have. So what, what we did was we... we we stormed into it and, um, and cheated in these extra cameras. Um, as I said, G George's theory went through to David's unit as well with his director, that one camera was going to do pretty well everything, all, all the big stunts and, and the whole lot. So we, we, we desperately tried to to add the cameras as best we could. We weren't often given much chance. We had about 10 Canon 5Ds. We started out testing a little Olympus camera that had built-in stabiliser and our, our visual effects boffins, uh, they grudgingly okayed the data output from the Olympus, um, but uh, it didn't do too well. Um, it tended to shut down uh, on impact at any time, and then learn, <laughs> and then lost all the all the all the all the, all the information was lost. Um, and so George came to me one day, and, and they were sort of grizzling about the Olympus cameras, and and to George, and and uh, and then George just said, "Johnny, use five Ds. That's all there is to it." So we went out and bought another ten of them or something, and um, and we threw them up. We tried to protect them, obviously, as as much as we could. We put them in. Um, <laughs> we put them in uh, pelican cases and cut holes in the end and padded them and all that sort of thing, but um, we, we still managed to lose quite a few of them. There's still a few hanging around in the Mimian Desert with <laughs> 16 to 35 lenses that were never found. So we'd throw these things in. The Grippo boys, again, were fantastic. They had boxes of little, little screwy things they'd little pipes and things, they'd, we'd say, quick, you know, whack one in there. So we've got the wheel in the foreground and when the, when the girls come out of the truck, we've got the big wheel in the foreground going. Um, what is fantastic with somebody, working with somebody like George, on SimTrav, <laughs> on SimTrav, um, they didn't even worry about the, the fact the wheels weren't going around. They, oh, we'll do that in post. We'll, we'll, we'll turn the wheels in post. And, and the, the visual effects boys just nod and say, yeah, yeah, we'll just turn the wheels in post. <laughs> so all of that, you know, George, George after all of his uh, Pig and Penguin films, um, was very au fait with the computer and, and the developments of it um, and tended to, to push this, this film into the computer in post big time. Everything was, don't worry, I'll fix it in post. Um, which is true. It's just that the <laughs> visual effects boys are all dying because they didn't have the budget for it. But we all knew that that's the little game that's played, that if Warner Brothers want the finished picture, they'll pay. So that it will be done. And I think George knew that. We all know that. So, but it even got down to a stage where I remember listening on the comms one day and George was directing one of the actors and he had a gun or something and he had to... He'd lift the gun a little higher 
Not too high, too high. A little lower, a little lower, a little lower. No, too low. A little higher. Oh, don't worry. We'll do it in post. <laughs> well, we killed ourselves laughing, but it, it's true. That's what, what George will do. If he, does, if he doesn't like where an arm is, he just rotos it and moves it to where he like it and then rotos it back on again. Um, even if I can be brutally honest, uh, we were doing a, cl- a pick-up of uh, Charlie's in, a, in Australia late, late last year. And there was, it, was a, it was a medium shot. She had to change gear with this great big gear stick and she's driving the truck and she's yelling dialogue out that window and changing gear at the same time. But George wanted to add a line. But he loved that, the medium shot, so much that when we were shooting it, he came up to me quietly and he said, Johnny, just make sure the mouth is in continuity line. He said, I just need that. So he was going to, in post, take, take that off and put it on the medium shot <laughs> for her to say the line. So it's an interesting um, revolution that I think we're going through and, 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 uh, and directors are... Uh, learning what they can do in post um, and George is certainly well ahead on all of that, I can assure you, with what he's doing. We, we, we had a big, very big day for night uh, and I think even on film when you've sort of honed and you, your brain's well into day for night for a film negative, uh, you shudder a bit because... Uh, as you can imagine, in the Namibian desert at midday and, a, and an acid blue bald sky like that, there's not much you can do really except pray and uh, take to the drink. If, <laughs> so, uh, but we were on digital and uh, always, I've always been of the theory that if you can create uh, a sense of night, uh, and remembering this is a post-apocalyptic film that uh, in the cutting of the film there'll be 18 sun, suns and there'll be about nine or ten moons because every cut, will the moon and sun will be coming in from different directions. But the speed of cutting uh, that George has, has emphasised to us would mean that you really haven't got time to analyse that. If you've got time to analyse that, then the shot's too long. So it's all great theory. I love them. They're all great theories. George has got these fantastic things going uh, in his mind and, and, uh, and there's a lot of good theory in it, I feel. That, but, but the thing was that uh, in the fast cutting, you can, you can talk about, say, um, Paul Greengrass and, and uh, Bourne Alamatum you're so fast you don't know what the damn hell's going on half the time. So, and a lot of his camera work is deliberately shaking to get frame energy, um, which I think seems to bug most people. And a lot of films are doing that these days. Now, now Fury Road is handheld. It's Steadicam, it's handheld, it's... it's uh, and we'll get to those edge vehicles. Davey's going to do a big thing on the edge. Um, that... All the movements of all the cameras are different. But once again, we'll fix it in post. Because what they can do is that they can select a shot which they feel this camera movement is ideal and they just code that and enslave the rest of the film to that movement. So all the shots will have the same movement. So it didn't matter that the edge cameras we got from America, which um, Davey will talk about, for a million bucks each, um, that shot probably 40% of the movie um, was incredibly smooth. I mean, they're an amazing machine uh, and the boys who drove them and operated them were amazing. Um, They simply were shooting the most incredible tracking stuff. To be able to do a close-up of a driver on a truck like that and then pull back and around and across the front of an Amada ending up in a big wide shot is simply awesome. That was the first one that came out. Um, the tank on the back is an air bottle to blow, to blow uh, uh, compressed air down to the down to the uh, down to the mat box. Um, With, to spin the mirror, there was a mirror. Oh, a mirror. Oh, no, a mirror. Oh, they had a, a mirror. glass, you know, a glass spinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, 
And it, it, as I said, an awesome machine that, that did most of the work. Most of the time, dailies were fairly boring because it was so good. You know, you're watching an action movie of cars and vehicles trying to bang into each other and whatnot, and this, <coughs> this camera is shooting it like a commercial. It was rock steady, and it just looked as though the trucks weren't moving. It was so steady. So they will add in the frame, they'll add movement to that, to that um, edge vehicle's material. The, edge, the first edge we got out was so good they got another one. So we had two, and it was supposed to be one for our unit and one for David's unit. But there was uh, a bit of a battle between units when we only had one. So the first one came out at a cost of a million bucks all up. There was a bit of a battle between main unit and the second unit as to who was going to get the edge arm for the day. So in the end, someone high up the ladder said, well, bugger this, let's get, get another one. So they wheeled another one in, and there it is. And they, uh, uh, they were used uh, daily for, from then on. Um, uh, so much so that um, certainly on our little unit, uh, I say little, but 400 for lunch sometimes, um, <laughs> Uh, our, our director, Guy Norris, he would design shots and stunts around this, the, the one camera. Uh, John was talking about one camera earlier. So he would design a, a stunt around this one camera and we'd try to do the whole stunt with one camera. Uh, but uh, knowing that uh, editors like coverage, we would try and get in our other little Canon cameras and uh, our other Alexa to get extra coverage. But Guy wasn't too interested in that initially, so it was a bit of a battle sometimes to get these other cameras in. And sometimes we'd rig six or seven cameras on the various vehicles. But uh, if we weren't uh, ready when the edge arm was right to go, then there was no waiting for us generally. Um, and off they went with the edge arm. So we had to work, myself and the uh, South African grips that we had on action unit, as it was called, uh, we had to work pretty lickety split to uh, to get those cameras in so that they were ready to go when the edge arm was, uh, was right to go. So everything was really designed around uh, the shot the edge arm was doing and all we were trying to do was give the editor uh, extra, extra coverage of, of that stunt. So how is it stable like that? Uh, some Russian man did it. I don't know how he did it. Uh, yes, they are, there are gyros. The arms, the arms stabilised and the head stabilised. And the edge arm is a spin-off of the Russian arm. A lot of you might have heard of the Russian arm, uh, which was designed by some Russian who lives in America with a background in the military. Uh, he designed the Russian arm initially. Uh, and then there's been a few spin-offs of that uh, subsequently. And this edge arm is, is a spin-off of that. So, uh, yeah, so the head, it's a f the head is called a flight head. It's stabilised and the arm is stabilised too. I don't know how. They pointed out these little, they're electronic gyros. Right. And they're all over the arm. Now, I don't know how they work, but uh, anyhow, it was pretty, it was pretty stable. What's the length of that arm? What 26 feet. 26 feet. But these boys, well, they were pretty good. Uh, the Americans that came out, um, we, they had a driver. Uh, an arm operator and a head operator and a, and a technician uh, and the, uh, the camera operator, uh, the head operator, he used just a little joystick. Um, he had wheels there. Each arm you had five? Each arm we had uh, four, four Americans and one of our focus pullers. Mm. But uh, yeah, he used the little joystick because it was easier, rather than bouncing across the desert trying to uh, operate wheels, um, the little joystick was more controllable. I had a go one day, but God, forget it. Give me wheels any day. But, um, but uh, they were pretty impressive in terms of where they could get this thing. You know, belting across the desert at 80 k's uh, with stunt guys flying off the top of that war rig thing, they, they could get it in uh, pretty close. What's the height of it? Oh, that was another thing. Uh, that was called the ledge arm. <laughs> we christened that the ledge arm. And basically it was one of our picture vehicles and the, some of the picture vehicles had very wide wheelbases. So we commandeered one of these and the grips built a, 
I don't know, a 36 foot tower, I think it was, on top of that. And we put a, su a, a suspension arm that the edge guys had off the top of that uh, and put a camera on that to get a high angle perspective rather than get up in there in a chopper. We were, <laughs> we were building across the desert and sometimes we'd, we'd hand hold uh, an M up there as well. I never got up there, bugger that. <laughs> I, I, I said, and the director's an ex-stunt guy and he was quite happy to look through a camera and point it as best he could. So I said, okay, up you go, you're on your own. But um, that was quite successful, really. The, yeah, the ledge arm mm, was good. But they're pretty impresses, impressive pieces of uh, equipment. They'd want to be for a million bucks each, you know. So what yeah. lenses were you using? Lenses. Which, lenses? What lenses? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, Christ. Well, I mean, what, when, uh, uh, it, 14. I'll, I'll, were, you, were you using Panavision standards? Or oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no, we had little zooms. We had a right. bunch of primes. We didn't use the primes much, did we? Well, 40 only those 40. little 15mm mil, 15 millimetre jobs that they found on the shelf. Right. When we swung over to 2D, um, it did open up a whole uh, bag of being able to work inside the cab of the truck. We could get three cameras, four cameras in there, tucked away in little corners. When the, uh, Ricky Schamberg and Michelle went over to America, not only to... Um, to check all the lenses in, that they had there because Australia's not, not holding uh, the full variety, so they went over there. They also went over there to buy all their disposables for a much cheaper price. And, um, but they checked lenses and they found gathering dust in a little shelf in a back room at Panavision, a, a set of 15 mil lenses, only about that long, deep and, and, and really great little 15. They were perfect for what we wanted inside the cab of the truck. Now, and what, uh, I forget the lens bloke's name, but uh, there's, there's... Neville. What's no, that? no. Oh, in, in Panavision. Panavision. Oh, right. there's, there's a lens man in Panavision. He's just a whiz. And he said, oh, I'll, I'll recalibrate that lens to so your hyperfocal distance goes from basically the front of the element of that lens to about 15 feet at T8. And that's exactly what we wanted. Depth, depth all that didn't have to pull focus on it. We could shove that little M in there with that camera on it, and it would be sharp. Didn't quite work out like that, it never does. But you know, paper theory is one thing and practical is another. But so we ended up with uh, four of those or something, five of them or something, and they've disappeared. <laughs> Nobody knows where they are. <laughs> you could look in <laughs> huh? you could you, you could look in Sydney somewhere, I'd say. <laughs> Not sure where, but um, but other than that, we, uh, also the fact was that when George swung to, to 2D, you know, by lunchtime on the Monday, I'd, I'd suddenly thought, what about the 3D? Because when you, when at that stage, you know, four or three years ago, um, at that stage to shoot uh, 2D and take a 3D post off was a very complex Plex affair in the 2D. You know, you, you, you read up uh, what's his name's thing on uh, Alice in the Looking Glass, and he only used wide angle lenses, wouldn't go beyond a 50mm lens to get the perspective right. We didn't do any of that, we just shot it. And, and I thought to myself, what's Warner Brothers going to do? They, they're going to demand a 3D, which they did. And George, being the inimitable George, fantastic, he said, uh, Well, you want to. 3D version, you, you do it in post, you pay for it. So they just went, oh, OK. But we didn't take any consideration. As you could see, I had, a, I had my favourite lens there, the 11 to 1. Um, there all the other cameras, we had short zooms. I love zooms, I've always used them, always. Um, so little short ones and fat ones and thin ones and we, we just distributed those and we found we had enough. And we had a little box of primes that, you know, sort of get you out of trouble, super speeds and stuff ready to plug in at dusk or whatever. But basically they were normal shooting, 2D cinema shooting kind of lenses, really nothing special except these little 15 mil jobs that are lost. <laughs> um, and so they, they, we, uh, you'll, you'll, <clears throat> with that knowledge you'll, you'll see that when we do go to interior of the cab, you, you, there's probably got the little 15 mil job on it. These are Truggies, uh, two specially designed dune buggies made for the company. Um, there's a very funny story about those. With the first time they went to the desert and got all the trucks over there, um, 
Some stuntman arrived and they said, those are the truggies there for camera work, you know, in the, you know, chasing things and doing tracking shots. Some study said, oh, I might take one of those for a burn through the desert, which he did. And as he came back to the base camp, he swirled in, pulled the handbrake on to do a handbrake turn, and the thing just went pop, like that. And they quickly cleaned it all up, and, but the chassis was slightly bent. Somebody drove it a year later when they went back to start the film properly and said, there's something wrong with this car. It just doesn't seem to happen. Um, and then the truth came out. So we'd had a, that little funny arm uh, on it as well, which was a, which was a stabilising arm. It's got these big grey pipes here go down. They're air blowers uh, in the mat box, and they go back to a very sophisticated Bunnings leaf blower <laughs> back there. Uh, two of those on each side um, that were running, and things like that. So it's all a little bit Barney, Barney rubble, really, but. Um, that's the way we used to do it in the early days and it seems to have hung on and it works, you know. We use those things a lot, uh, screaming in it and actually going in amongst all of, there were 40 odd uh, action vehicles and you could throw that thing in the middle and it looked just like all the others. You can see the aerials there for the RF. The RF was amazing. We had, you know, we had towers on every hill. They were always in shot. And I remember even the Warner Brothers rep saying, every shot you've got an RF tower in shot. You know, all that'll have to be painted out. Well, I, didn't, I wasn't going to worry us because I didn't worry George. He got, do it in post. So, but the RF system was pretty damned incredible. I mean, it could go... What we had was that... Well, David, you explain that bloody thing because well, that was well, yours. Well, yeah, we use these a lot on uh, our little second unit. Um, but there was only room for two people in the truggy. That was the driver and the uh, focus puller. So the truggies would belt off across the desert uh, after the armada or in amongst the armada and the camera on the front of that suspension thing was in a, a Libra head uh, with an RF feed back to a little combi van where the operator sat stationary with his wheels operating the camera, all on RF. Uh, and we could send the Armada off across the desert as we did lots and lots of times and our record for getting the signal back to the camera operator in the van was 6Ks. So, and we could operate the camera, the image was perfect. Uh, after 6Ks on that day it started to break up and we asked them to come back. But um, yeah, the camera operator never, never travelled with, with the vehicles. They always Were stayed... Delays? Hmm? Were there no. No, they're minimal, minimal delay. But, uh, yeah, yeah, they you know, sold a couple of that. frames, nothing really, nothing, nothing to, of concern. But the, the RF was fantastic. And it all went back to George too, back to George's command vehicle <laughs> when he was in it. He had a big bus with, um, I don't know, how many monitors? Six or seven monitors in it. Uh, you know, big TV Two screens. Two big leather chairs and a toilet. And so... Uh, <laughs> He, he could sit there and monitor what was going on, sometimes kilometres away. You know? uh, and he needed to approve everything. Everything that we did, George needed to approve. So if he wasn't sitting in his uh, command vehicle looking at what we were shooting, um, the video guy in main unit could record it, the video split guy, and show George when he was ready. But if we were out of range, if we were 20 or 30 uh, k's away, then we'd shoot whatever shot we were doing and then we'd uh, put that on a hard drive, send it back to George, and George would either say yay or nay. Um, so we had time to sit around from every now and again, drink coffee and stuff. But, uh, but no, George needed to approve everything uh, we did. I mean, it was fair enough, he's the boss. So. But the RF, yeah, was fantastic. Uh, in light of the RF, also, we had a DIT man, <coughs> which is a digital intermediate technician which I'd never heard about even anywhere. And he, that's his truck. He had his own truck. And that's him. It. Oh, that's him? Yeah. That's Mark. That's Did Mark. Mark. Did um, Mark. He had monitors in there. What did we call it? The Qantas lounge or something. People would disappear in there because, you know, air conditioned and, and wouldn't come out. Um, <laughs> and or, he had a tent. Or, or he had a tent, yeah. But... Um, this dit man was an interesting guy because uh, he, um, 
he was telling me what exposure to use. And I wasn't used to that. Right? <laughs> um, and I always wear meters because you do on film. If you're lighting and operating, you, you wear them and you can whip out a whip out a little spot meter and do a little check and make sure things are still in order. Um, so I had those on. A lot of people said, you're doing a digital film and you're still wearing meters and you've got a dick man. And, and uh, I said, well, yeah. But after a while, I, I, I realised we, we argued a lot, the dick man and I, about the exposure that went on. We, we also, through our, once again, our fantastic visual effects boys, they were really great guys. Um, some of them can get fairly abrupt and, and arrogant in a way, and, but our guys were just stunning. They were there to help, they were there to, uh, to make it all work and help us and whatnot. So um, they were w uh, complaining a little that our, our exposures were a little, a little high and um, suggested that we look at derating the Alexa from 800 to 400 ASA which we did, and um, we did on our unit. David bucked the system for a week and a half or something. <coughs> um, Harry told me it was 800. <laughs> <laughs> so we, 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 I'd be moved down to 400 ASA, and it was interesting then, once I did that, that I started to agree more with what the dit man was getting to. So we actually smoothed things out between us all um, by, by virtue of that... Um, that travel. So was he, was he there for exposure? Yes, yeah. exposure and, for and maintenance. You know, like, like they're, they're, they know all about those codex things yeah. and all that junk. Um, but also, yes, he's got all his waveforms, he's got his highlights, lowlights, and his, his, his worries about peaking out. What do they call that? Peaking out or something. Um, <laughs> And he, and he jumps on you if you, if you, if you go out over the top. Uh, it got a bit awkward because even if there was the, a, in the centre of frame there was a flash of, of sun or something on a piece of chrome, he'd want the whole frame pulled down to get control of that peaking. Otherwise you had to spray it down like the old days. Whereas on film you never worried about that. As you know, you just let the butte highlight fantastic. Um, but this suddenly became a different bag with all this peaking business. So we had a few little arguments and in the end I thought, this isn't my future. Um, <laughs> and Ricky Schamberg was a great little first AC and he was very interested in all the exposure and stuff, so as was Sean Conway the gaffer. And then I, one morning I went in and I, I grabbed those two guys and I said, why don't you blokes with the dit man work out exposure and tell me what it is? And then that way you're learning what the dit man's doing, you're learning all about the digital thing, it's your future, and you can go for your life and I'll go sailing. So, <laughs> so they said, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. But, so I took my metres off, put them in the truck, and uh, I couldn't handle it, couldn't handle it. So, but also what we found then, getting back then to the truggies and the RF system, was that when we took off down the valley, the dit man couldn't follow us. So he was out of range and suddenly we've dived into shadow sun, shadow sun as we go into the canyons. Um, so the exposure's going crazy all over the shop. So the meters went back on again. And as we roared down in, I could see shadow coming up. You know, I'd think, oh, all right, and I'd quickly do a reading, yell out a stop and get it back into a ballpark at least so that the post boys, you know, weren't, weren't um, too out of whack with the exposure. Which then segues across to our day for night that um, once again our, our, our visual effects boys used to walk around with their little laptops and show you pictures that they'd manipulated into day for night. Um, and they were fantastic. They were absolutely fantastic. They were whacking, you know, a ball scene like that. Um, they'd put a grad in the sky and put a few stars up the top there and pull everything down. and. Unbelievable, but what it gave you was a, a sense of night. It wasn't an accurate night by any means, but to a film goer, it was a sense. And, and I, I've worked on that all, all my life in films, that creating that sense of a, something, of an atmosphere um, or an atmospheric situation is enough. That once the audience say, oh, well, that's, that's night. 
And this, again, is post-apocalyptic, so who knows what it's like at night up there. Um, and so what happened was then we just shot everything. But they, in their testing, they, they said, would you mind uh, opening up two stops for the day for night? Which, in going back to film negatives, crazy. I mean, you, you just, you know, they're, they're on drugs, obviously. It's like the opposite. Right? It's like the opposite. Total opposite. Yeah. But the theory was, okay, so the, the war rig's a black vehicle and then you get the sun up there and, and this side is in deep shadow and it's black and you've got people in that shadow. Once again, George is pretty adamant, you know, he, we don't need lights. He'd say, he'd be yelling at me saying, Johnny, don't need lights. I'll fix it in post. And, and, and we actually had a nose to nose at one stage because during the day for night, I, I was rolling in a, a vehicle of some kind, one of those red things with a lamp on it to get eye fill. But even though we're overexposed two stops and there's information in there, you had to have something in there because once they printed it down, that'd be gone and printed up. So I've got the light going in and I could hear George on the comm saying, we don't need that light, get that light out of there. So I, right. So off I went and around the corner and I finally, where's George, where's George? You know, because he could have been anywhere. And uh, he was in one of the edge vehicles and uh, I knew he was in the back seat, but the window was up and it was tinted. I couldn't see him. Bang, 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 bang on the window. And the window came down. George was there. I said, George, I've done 10 DIs. And I know damn well if there's nothing there, <coughs> you cannot bring it up in a, in a, in a DI with rotoing the eyes, pulling them up. And I said, if it's not there, it's never going to be there. I said, I don't want you to hate me in eight months' time in post when you find there is nothing there to pull up and walked off. And after that, I never had any trouble. <coughs> I never had any trouble. Whenever a light went in, George didn't complain at all. But it is true. What the theory was, and, and you guys all know this, is that if you're two stops over in a dark, dark area, shadow area, then uh, when you get into post and you're going to print down four stops, say, to get your, get your nice mood, if, say, there's somebody in that shadow area and you want to roto them and isolate them and pop them a little bit more, then as you do that, you won't get noise. Because, you know, in, in, if it was fully underexposed, the four stops under, or, you know, difference, then you're going to get noise when you pull up anything out of that shadow area. So their theory, and damn good one, is that by pulling, by overexposing to, uh, two stops into that shadow area, on your negative, basically, meant that when you print it down, you could always pull back up areas in a dark situation, in a dark area, you could pull that up uh, in the DI and not get noise in that. So off we went, but pretty damned hard, you know, to be midday in the middle of the Namibian desert and, and shooting day for night and you're overexposed two stops, you know, you're down to sort of 100 ASA. <laughs> and you're trying to match what second unit shooting at dusk with car headlights. <laughs> where car headlights mean something. Uh, but George will match it in post and it'll be fine. John, how did you go with the dip band with highlights then? With the... Well, well if, you, if you're all overexposing two stops, how did you go with all your prime highlights and all that sort of stuff? What's, how did you react when you're trying to shoot? Mostly, uh, you know, I used to trottle off to the, the dip band and, and check it out. Mostly the skies, when they were acid blue, they were still well in, in, in uh, control. It was only when we were down on the coast where there was sort of like a, a white mist. That's where we ran into a bit of bother. And we'd look at the frame and think, well, there's nothing in the dark area there, so we'd nip it, nip it down a bit until... You know, we just played with, with the whole situation. Mostly it was still... This is... Yeah, see, that's that, that kind of... Um, Marine layer, like in Los Angeles, you get that white, cluggy sort of stuff. We were shooting in that. I mean, to be honest, the film is everything. In the day for night sequences, you can be cutting directly from full sun front lit to that, to side lit, to back lit, you name it. It, 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 it doesn't worry, George, as far as the speed and pace of the editing will, that will occur. It doesn't worry him at all. Um, 
and I have to agree, we, we were lucky enough to see 42 minutes of, uh, of the cut footage that we came out of Namibia. Since then, we've obviously done a big pickup shoot in Sydney last year that we haven't seen cut in. Um, but the, the stuff we saw is most interesting uh, because of that theory of George's um, of frame rates and length of shots, um, but also the fact that compositionally, whatever was the centre point of that shot had to be in the centre of frame. So in the faster cutting that he's got, your eye won't have to shift on an anamorphic frame, won't have to shift to find the next subject when you've only got 1.8 seconds of time to do that. So it, it's a great theory. It came up once on a TV show that I was operating on 100 years ago and that theory of not having to move your eyes and being able to fast cut and it just goes bang, 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 takes you into it. And that is basically the whole of the film. You know, we, we, all we would hear all the time on the comms was, was uh, suggesting a camera was to say, was George saying, put the crosshairs on a nose, put the crosshairs on a nose, or in our case it was a red dot, put the red dot on a nose. And it didn't matter whether you're in the truck with you know, Charlie's there driving and you've got three gorgeous girls there, you didn't offset to, to grab any, any information in the background. You put the crosshairs on Charlie's nose and your camera had to be in the centre. He's very, he's very disciplined that way. Everything is symmetrical with George. But so obviously that goes against the grain, you know, of a, tra of a trained camera operator, especially when you're shooting two, three, five to one, you know, we've got with all that room on the sides, you're not trained to put the subject in the middle of the, in the middle of the frame. So I think it was a bit of a battle early on for the operators to realise that uh, this is what was required. And George never explained, I don't think, did he? Why, why he wanted to do that? No, it came out later, yeah, that, that, that it was in the editing that he knew he was going to cut as fast as he could but not lose information on every shot that, that happens with other films. That, that every shot had to pay, pay its way and progress the film and be understand, understandable. So it, it's, a, it, it's a great theory and I'm dying to see the whole film, I must confess, to see how that theory works, that you know, they're in the centre for, for, the, for the fast cutting, that he's got um, all of his... his uh, I have heard that he, he's a lovely man, he really is. He came up to me afterwards and he said, thank you. God for your paparazzi camera. Oh, uh, paparazzi. Right? That leads you to paparazzi. Yeah, good idea, John. Paparazzi. Paparazzi. Jack. Here it is. Come um, on. There it is. That's it. I'd sneak this thing in. And, and we called it the paparazzi because it was an 11 to 1 zoom and I was able to drive right through and pick up close-ups of the girls. And you, you're trying to balance a production value of your shot, you know, to, for the editor, that you know that this is happening with that actor there and they're turning around and... You know, if he wanted to use take four and then pick up take five, he, he's got to have something to cut between. I'll go grab a reverse on, a, on one of the girls there or something. And uh, I'd sneak this paparazzi camera around. And he's such a lovely guy because, you know, he'd often he'd say, what's that paparazzi camera doing? <laughs> so he knew, he knew we were out there. Um, <laughs> But he very often said to me, he said, I don't think we need that today, Johnny. You know, you sit back and eat some Namibian donuts. You'll be all right. <laughs> and, but I couldn't handle that. You know, I, I, if you're there to work, I'm going to bloody work. So, so and, the, and my, the crew I had were from New Zealand. They were fantastic. And so we just shoved, every, shoved it in all the time, just kept shooting. I think that's why we ended up with th the equivalent of 3.2 million feet of, of uh, film negative um, for them to look at. Uh, but since uh, George wonderfully has, has said, thank God you had that thing going because there are times when we did get caught and we'd say, what's he got on that camera there? And, the, you know, the, the editing boys did collate and, uh, and collect everything, every single shot. Uh, and they would, you know, George said they'd, some, they'd find something that would just do it. 
and managed to get them out of trouble there and back into another take and away they'd go. So it did work and at the end uh, he did say quietly to me, he said, you know, I used to think only one camera was needed in the perfect spot to shoot the scene. He said, but I like multiple cameras a lot more now. <laughs> so I thought, oh, that's great because uh, I think they're worth it. I think editors have often said to me at the end of movies, um, it's fantastic. Uh, one, of the, one of them said, I said, why, why do you think it's fantastic? And he said, I can cut for performance. I don't have to wait for continuity. And I thought, damn it, that must make a better movie. So, you know, that was early in a piece in, in America and, and uh, when I started doing it. Um, and uh, I just think that theory is great. It, will, it, it allows the editor to make a better movie uh, for emotion and pace. He can go, he's got total control. Oh, yeah. Or you actually ever shooting at a specific time of day that on your request, I guess? No, that shoot? doesn't happen anymore. No, you're just told to shoot it. Um, <laughs> and that's not just this film, it's other films too. It's <coughs> studios now, they, they're bulldozing everybody into the ground and they know the value of post-production and they, you, you can't do it. The other thing, and I hate to say it, but I, I suppose I've got to, is that when you've got an actor that keeps you waiting, we're all there at seven o'clock ready to go. When you've got an actor who will be two and a half hours, three hours late every morning, you can't shoot the, with the light you want. You gotta shoot it when he arrives and when he's ready. So it kills you. But once again, you know, as I've said, it didn't worry George at all. Light did not worry George. You can see that scene there is, is uh, those two frames, the one before had a lovely golden light there. And the, this next shot, which is gluggy, overcast fog, is the same scene. Lighting and that, continuity and that, and that, was out the window. And that's all day for night. <laughs> so, so dying to see <laughs> what it looks like. Might never work again, but who cares? <laughs> just was keep... There, was there any um, storyboard? You said earlier on the whole film was being storyboarded in 1999 or whatever it was. Was there any... What would happen at the beginning of the day? Would you just say that person's going to walk there and shoot that or...? At the end of, for the next day's shoot? Or the next day or however... No, no, we never knew what we were doing the next day. Um, <laughs> no, no, the, the thing was when I came on board, uh, when, when I got the phone and went and saw Dean and did a, a, a week and a half overlap, there was no script at all in existence. This whole film had been running without scripts. But they had storyboards and the, the uh, conference, Fury Road conference room was a big room and the storyboard started, you know, the beginning of the film there and went right round and down to the other end, little frames about this big. And uh, it was very funny because Warner Brothers came in and said, George, we want a script. And they said, well, we haven't got one. <laughs> look at the storyboards. You come down and have a look at the storyboards. You can walk around the conference room, have a look at the storyboards. And George, we don't work that way. We want a script. So they wrote a script. And uh, I've got to say, it wasn't the best. <laughs> it was shot together. The dialogue was dreadful and silly and awful. Um, but it was a script and Warner, Warner's were, were then happy with the script. The thing I found was that these boys, George and, and Guy Norris and... Uh, PJ Voten, producer of First AD, um, and George, had been working on this, talking about it, storyboarding it for 10 years. So they all basically knew what they were doing. I think, in all honesty, I think uh, PJ Voten, in this order, PJ and, and Guy Norris, knew more than the rest of us. Um, George knew it as well, but was jogged by them as to exactly what the mechanics of a scene, a stunt scene, might be. Um, and PJ was, you know, we used to call him the walking iPod because he's got a brain that goes at a thousand miles an hour. 
but he knew all the rest of it. He knew what the, was happening to the girls and, and to the other characters in the film. He knew all that. So I'd get in the command vehicle in the morning, get picked up at the little house that I was in and, uh, and drive an hour out to the Blanky Flats um, and uh, they would be yakking away about this and I didn't have a clue, didn't have a clue. They'd put storyboards, uh, PJ would put storyboards out, still didn't have a clue. Um, but they just knew it so well, all those guys. They'd been, they'd been nurturing and, and labouring over that for years. This was a, a camera stunt that George had planned and uh, Scully built the trench, put the crane in there and a martyr of 40 vehicles coming towards you and you start nice and high and then of course you go down and the cars go straight over the top at full speed. Um, so he cemented, he had to cement it because the Namibian sand would have caved in but he cemented it all and it was operated by cables across, across here by grips, grips out of, you know, well safe, out of shot. But that, that was something, you know, Scully took a week or so to build that and then well, I think you shot it, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. $8,000 at whole cost. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, you can maybe just see here. The grips told us they had a budget. You know, so. There's a little, you can, can you see that little mark across there? Yeah. There's some uh, PVC pipe with cables in it that goes from the dolly that the crane sitting on there to 20 foot of track which is 30 yards away out of shot and um, there's a dolly on that track and the cable was attached from this dolly to that dolly and when that dolly was pushed and there was a cable on the the lift as well I don't know how it worked or not but anyhow when the dolly was pushed uh, 30 yards away the crane uh, jibbed down so as the armada came we started up as high as that would go that's a GF 8 I think whatever height that is, um, and as the armada came towards us and straddled this hole, we, we tilted down, we craned down till we were just looking past the lip of the, uh, where that track, where that board is there, uh, and they drove over the top of us. Look good. Good shot. Mm. How, how did you work out the timing? Brett McDowell worked out the timing, <laughs> the dolly grip, and we didn't get hit once. No, we did it uh, three or four times, but uh, he, no, he was, he, he was good. Yeah, worked well. Would have been embarrassing if he got it wrong because it would have been a bit of a mess because it was a big truck driving over it, I'll tell you. Mm. <laughs> Another 8,000. <laughs> so all those, those sort of things were, were planned years before, basically, you know, on the storyboard system. So um, they weren't a surprise to anybody who knew that. Um, um, How many of those large um, trucks did you have? Just one? The what? Three. Three of them. Three trucks. Oh, yeah. the war rigs, yeah, three of those. Yeah. So they were split up sometimes bet uh, two to one between main unit and second unit, or the other way, two to one the other way. Would have been nice to have four occasionally, mm -hmm. but three was good enough. And were they all exactly the same? Yeah. Like oh, yeah. Yeah, they were. Sometimes they were in different uh, conditions, you know, uh, they deteriorate or they change the condition as they get further into the desert. So sometimes they're more muddy or less muddy. And, uh, so the art department had to chop and change sometimes. What was their weight? Oh, God knows. They were heavy. But they were, they were based on a, uh, they were all wheel drive, I think. Mm. And they were Czechoslovakian. And, military. Yeah, mil some military thing. And uh, we had a stunt guy. We had two guys driving him, two drivers, uh, one guy from Australia and an, and an American guy. But the Australian guy, was uh, his name was Lee, just fantastic. He could take this thing anywhere, anywhere. Never got bogged. It was just fantastic. We did dig up the desert a bit. The, <laughs> the, Namib the Namibian government gave us, oh, I don't know how, what area it was, but it was sort of, 8Ks that way and 8Ks that way, and it was flat, one of, one of our major locations. Uh, and they said, okay, boys, that eight by eight kilometres out there is yours. You can do what you like with it. And 
Oh yeah, the, some of the greenies around town weren't too happy with us because we did chop it up a bit, obviously. But um, yeah, the, the truck would go anywhere. Mm. Basically we had this, this location here, oh no, not that location, but we had one location that was just dead flat uh, and another location that was quite hilly, quite spectacular, big rocks and was, uh, it was worth going to Namibia for the locations. We got in Namibia what we certainly wouldn't have got in Broken Hill. It was worth the trip. Yeah, no, it looked great. It's going to, it's going to be a great looking film. How long were you there for? Oh, nearly, I think, five months or so in Namibia. And then we went to Cape Town for three weeks and shot on stage. Mm. But uh, with the, the, the vehicles, the vehicles are fantastic, fantastic. So a combination of the vehicles, the location, and the wardrobe and makeup, it's going to, there was some pretty uh, interesting images. It's going to look really good. Certainly, these boys did stunts that are just awesome. A lot of post work on them, uh, particularly with flame and smoke in the explosions and things like that, which really enhance it. But some of them are awesome, and, and uh, nobody was injured. No which was great, and they're awesome stunts, they really oh, are. Oh, there's a big bang in this film, big, big mm. bang. <laughs> That's top mm. secret, don't uh, Yeah, yeah, keep, keep that to yourselves. This, um, uh, just going back quickly to the bungee rig, it was used so extensively that, can we go to that one? That's the one, I think, for the fight scene. We had a big fight scene under the war rig at the beginning of the, sh of the film, and... Um, the bungee, oh, yeah. that, that is simply a rig for the bungees, so that the fight scene occurs all around from the cab of the truck round to here. Uh, Max comes in from the desert here and meets, and then they have a big brawl about there. So we actually, um, Scully hung this thing over the top with, um, in fact, cables, more cables than that. There's two there with the bungees on them, so that during a fight scene we were handheld on the cameras, but you could, you could literally go from the ground and up and around and, and with the length of that rope, you could walk, you know, really quite a long way before it started to beat you up as far as weight was concerned. So it gave us a fantastic latitude of, of the cameras to be able to move around very, very quickly. Um, the, the, uh, as you know, with fight scenes, especially in the desert with sand and grit, they get beaten up, the actors and the stunt people. We had, we had some of the most awesome stunt people, look-alike stunt people that I've ever seen on a movie. Um, the the, the uh, New Zealand guy who was uh, the stunt stand-in for Tom Hardy, you almost couldn't tell. Oh yeah, when you, you could were two shoot... metres behind him, whether it was Tom or not. You could shoot very close on that double. He was great. Oh, amazing, but they. They, never, they were great people, but they, um, they were getting beaten up, you know. When you can imagine having a full-on brawl rolling over in the, in, the, um, in the sand and that becoming an abrasive between them. You, you try to work your cameras so that uh, it all happens as quickly as possible for them and get as much as you can in before they really start to get beaten up. So that, that bungee system pervades uh, our unit particularly. Um, and obviously the edge doing the big tracking, fast tracking shots. And um, steady cam, a lot of steady cam work. We had two steady cam operators, um, and often both of them working, or we'd DB would have one over there. So the whole film is a is a is a fluid film. And and once again it's the the movement of those cameras I, I believe will be slaved in post to agree with each other, which is going to be fascinating to see as well. So that whole theory of putting the, <coughs> the crosshairs on the nose applied to every shot? Yeah. Well, except, except for, for, except for well, action yeah. unit. Eh? Except for action. <laughs> George wasn't with us, so... <laughs> He'll just cut it out. <laughs> Um, yes, it did. It, 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 that was his theory, yes, and it, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting one. Uh, I guess it's hard when you handhold it. Well, it, it's not, he, he's not rigid about it, but as long as, as, long as the person or, or the, yeah, the person or the object in frame that is the point of that shot yes. 
is in the centre. Didn't matter whether you're cutting, you know, yeah. Rosie hunting and Whiteley in half in the background, which you wouldn't want to do. Um, doesn't matter. If, if, if you moved over to include her and that moved off, you'd get it. Crosshairs on the nose, <laughs> back again. So it, it, it's an interesting, I love it, because, because it's, a, it, it's a director's thumbprint on a film and it's great. And it's, it, even though it's hard, could be frustrating for us um, that are used to doing it our way, it's not our way, it's his way, it's her way. It's, it's, uh, you do a film to suit what they want because you know, magic comes out of that. Uh, so <coughs> it'll be interesting to see how, how, all, of this, um, how all of this goes. <laughs> Get our own ground glasses, mate. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we, a couple of the boys got beaten up pretty hard because, you know, it, as David said, it, it, it is very difficult when you've spent years and years and years uh, composing anamorphic frames and suddenly you're told to forget that, <sighs> take that away and <coughs> stick them in the centre. It, it can be frustrating in a way, but... You've just got to learn to accept it and, and go with it. Was there any other things he asked you to do which were just sort of totally out of left field? A headroom or any, anything like that? No. Oh, I see. Uh, no, no, just no, that. no. Just, just the, that just the crosshair deal. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to mention the crew. Uh, Ricky and Michelle went to America, and what happened was that yeah, Mad Max had come and gone in Sydney, and. Crews had been booked up and found that, that, you know, they were knocking back all other work and they'd go, oh, they bombed and they'd pull back and they haven't got a job. So pretty hard on crews like that. It's a, it can be very hard. So what we found was when it did gear up, or we thought it was gearing up, and, and, and I arrived and we started to work out how many cameras we needed, how many crew to fill that bill, how many were allowed. Um, we couldn't get anybody in Sydney because nobody wanted the job in case it bombed again and they didn't, you know, they'd lost a year's work basically. Or, so nobody did it. Uh, so, so Ricky, I don't know whether you know these boys, but oh, they're there somewhere. Ricky and, oh, they're on the end, the two, the two on the end there, Michelle and Ricky. They went to America to do the lensing and all, get all the equipment ready and shipped out to Australia. Um, and they started then a round of the town between, well, basically New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, um, and he, he, was there any English English there? Yeah. No palms. No palms. No. Um, so, and they put together a fantastic crew, unbelievable, from all these different countries, using equipment that basically they were not overly familiar with. You know, the amount of it and or, and all the type of it. Um, but they were stunning. They all just went like that. It was it was one of the greatest compatible camera crews, I think, really, I might have worked with. And, and uh, we had a lot of laughs, a lot of laughs, and, and uh, they did a great job. Um, that's a grip there, that's, that's um, Fizz. But uh, these two boys, these two boys are New Zealanders. They work together, I think, I think they've worked for you, haven't they, Ann? Yeah, Nigel, and these boys, AJ there from Sydney, Michelle and Ricky, and this, this fellow was uh, from, uh, from uh, South Africa. He was a young kid, he walked in, and he showed so much enthusiasm, uh, Michelle said, you're on. And he was great. And there were, there were others there that aren't, aren't up there. Well, they're in here now, but anyway, it was, a, it was just a fantastic international crew that had never worked together before, um, and it just went like that. It was like clockwork, it was fantastic. We also had another truck with Neville in it. Neville was um, a, uh, a mechanic, me camera mechanic, uh, ex Panavision South Africa. And we pulled him out of retirement, I think. Um, he was a whiz. He could pull, pull apart an Alexa completely, put it back together again and have it ready again in the morning. We, had a, we didn't have any problems with the big Alexas or, or the M's really. One of them blew up, it blew a board up. Um, and uh, Neville was allowed to replace that. Um, the way it happens today is that you're sitting in a truck in Namibia with an Alexa on a bench. 
hooked up to a laptop that's gone to Wi-Fi and there's boffins in Germany running through the boards. It's just amazing. So they found that one of the boards had collapsed and... Um, oh, David, did you have to put that? <laughs> what? Hey? God, strike me, Dave. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so they, they uh, uh, normally wouldn't let anybody change the boards in their uh, cameras, but uh, Neville had a fantastic reputation and they said, you can do it. So they shipped that out post haste and we grabbed that and Neville spent the night and put it, put it in and the camera was working the next morning. It was fantastic. And he also is a whiz at cleaning up and sharpening a Swiss Army knife. Absolutely <laughs> amazing. <laughs> This was, a, this was down in South Africa at the, at the back of the studios there. We built the biggest, longest green screen you've ever seen and we used it once. <laughs> Amazing, where it goes. You can, see, you can see the size of that wall rig and how high that green screen is. And, and we did actually use it once, or oh, maybe twice. <laughs> but it was... Um, it was pretty big. It was a big one, all right. A lot of the film is green screen, SimTrav green screen. Um, and once again, that'll be interesting to see the film as to how that integrates uh, intercutting with uh, live action on the move stuff. Uh, you know, as I said, George and, and Dean, I think mastered that SimTrav technique. And uh, I think it's gonna hold them in really good stead uh, in, this, in this film as well. No. Our, our visual effects boys were fantastic. They, they'd get gritted teeth, you know, talk to you through gritted teeth sometimes because <coughs> at one stage there in the desert, well, there we are in the desert and we've got more green screens than, than, than Paramount. But because when we surrounded the truck, the sun would come up there and this one would be in shade and that one would be in sun and this one would be in half sun and then it would go over the top and then it would change and that one. And they would just go, my God, we don't know what, you know, we can't, there it is, perfect example, um, we can't control it. And trying to light an area like that in the middle of the day with, with HMIs to try and get a balance on it, forget it. So they used to just shrug and say, oh, well. <laughs> Uh, we, we, they're going to be working, <laughs> I reckon. They'll be working solid, those boys. But, but they were so good about it all and, and, uh, and rocked along with George and his demands as well. Is all of that happening in Australia? Yes. All the posts in Australia? Yep. <coughs> George is the kind of guy that last time I went down to um, the Metro Theatre that he owns at King's Cross, uh, and upstairs he's bought his own base light and he's put a colourist in, so he's got a permanent DI suite, basically. And he's grading as he goes. Um, and uh, much that he says, you'll be there, Johnny, for the grade. And I say, yes, George, but I know who's going to do it. George will do it, I think, because I think he's done it in the past on most of his animated films and he knows what he wants. The, the film... Our stills photographer was very, very good. Um, he, um, he would play with his stuff on his computer and bring it in the next day and he'd say, have a look at this, you know. It was like, it was like two guys looking at Playboy magazine in the early <laughs> days, you know, have a look at this. And it would be a shot of Charlize or Tom or something and he'd whacked it on his computer and he'd screwed the contrast up until it starts to go crinkly and grain brought the grain, and it looked fantastic. And uh, so it, it, we, we snuffled it over to George and said, what do you think, George? And uh, he said, oh, I like that, I like that. So it could very well shift towards that. It'll be a really, and I hope it does, it'll be a really crunchy, um, organic kind of film. It won't be glossy. There'll be no speeches made here. It'll be... Crunge, grunge, you know, and so it should be. It should be as dirty as possible. Um, and, and what the stills, Jason Boland, what Jason was pulling up was amazing. I loved it. 
straight away. So it, it really means that it, 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 because you don't, you're not going for the perfect image or the perfect um, uh, f sort of rendition of, of a movie, you're going for the, the grunge, you can get away with a lot more. You know, I think by screwing contrast up and doing what they can do in post, flattening it out a little and the mid-ranges and working the mid-ranges, bottom ranges and top ranges, um, you, and then crunching it completely, um, it will then get a, get a shape and a look of its own that'll, that'll be the Mad Max look. And were you aware of that before or did it just develop throughout that? Everything developed for me. Coming on that late, there was a lot of secrets I didn't know about. Yeah. Um, that I'm still learning, <laughs> a bit late, but um, no, no, it's, it's very difficult. I think anybody, any of you who walked in and replaced somebody during, before or after a, a production, is, is, it's, it's hard to get into the groove. It's hard to get into the wavelengths of everybody. This one more so because 10 years of pre-production, they knew exactly, you know, as I said, the, the, the PJ Voten and, and Guy Norris, they knew exactly what they had to do and then George was then obviously in control of that, and I'm sitting there trying to trying to analyse where it fits into the film. There is so much happens in this film uh, over the short time that it, I think it's run, it'll be running less than two hours. Um, there's so much happens in there that even in the shooting of it, you, you think, where does this fit in? Are they going towards or back? You know, you, you just co couldn't. The only thing you could work out is. Is the Volkswagen still on the back? No, if that's gone, they're on their way back. <laughs> and if half, <clears throat> half the cab of the truck's gone, they're still on their way out. You know, so so you, that's the only way I could work it out. Well, that's too late. Well, you certainly couldn't work it out from the storyboards, because most of us were given a big book of storyboards, page after page of little images like that. Some, of, some people were lucky they got big images. And other people got colour ones, so they were really <laughs> special. But most of us had little, uh, little tiny images, page after page, and it was really difficult to work out what was going on. The guys up the top of the ladder, they knew because they'd been looking at these images for 12 years. But for those of us who just walked on, it was hard to, uh, it was hard to work out what was going on from these little storyboard frames. So was it shot close to being in sequence, David, or was it just all over? No, it was uh, it was uh, shot in sequence, pretty oh, much. Right. Yeah. Shot in sequence. Yeah. You yeah. couldn't tell though. <laughs> no. no. No, they start here, they go there, and they come back here, and that's how we shot it, pretty much. Yeah. Except for the start and finish, which was well, that was Australia mostly. Yeah. George was paramount, as I said earlier, about safety, um, and by dint of circumstances we nearly had a very bad accident and it was something that um, it really proved to us you've just got to be on the ball the whole time we had a scene where the, the truck it doesn't have the petrol tank on the back that's gone and been blown up a long time ago um, and it's running down a canyon and it's got these davits up on the back of the, above the Volkswagen body there and it goes under a low bridge and knocks out the davits. It only was allowed to knock out the davits. So we put a we put a, a camera in the back of this thing, looking <coughs> that way to see the see the bridge coming towards us. We put another one on the front of the tanker, looking back that way to see it go over the top and knock out the the things. We had cameras in the ground either side of the bridge. We had them everywhere. And I was in the in the war rig cab with the driver doing the point of view through the windscreen as it roared down this canyon and then saw the arch go over and got that point of view. And so we're all there. PJ was with me in the front of the cab and it was just one of those things that happened. The truck had to do about a kilometre round the hill and up to the top to get to the number one start point um, for the run down. We worked everything out. Everything was worked out. Those two cameras were the only two remote cameras uh, on the truck. So the crew were ready with ladders up the, up the top of the hill, would race in, put the ladders in, climb up, roll the camera, get back down and go. That was our arrangement. 
So we were sitting in the cab with the truck talking, we're waiting, we could hear on the comms. They got the ladders in, they're going up to roll the cameras. Okay, they rolled the cameras, yeah, they're right, everything's up there's right. And PJ and I are listening to that. That sounded, yeah, okay, we're right. Cameras down the bottom, we're rolling down the bottom. And the countdown started and off we went. Now they also changed the driver of the truck. And this circuitous, this, this sort of windy route down the bottom was pretty windy and it's a big truck. And they put a new driver in, I think <coughs> they put the American driver in. He hadn't done the run. And they said, you've got to go about 40. Well, I had my heart in my mouth. I mean, all the way down the hill, looking through the point, I thought we were going to smash into the wall of those. But somehow we got that truck around those corners at that speed. We shot under the bridge. I thought the bridge is, that's it, beauty. And as we rolled to a stop in the story, Charlize stops and looks around. So I thought, oh, well, I'll give them the point of view too. We've just stopped and the dust is there. And I thought that's, that could be a good little moment, just a couple of seconds of that. And uh, then I started to hear things like, get an ambulance down here quickly. And I thought, oh, Jesus, what's gone wrong? And, and uh, couldn't imagine who it would be because all of the, the, the cameras set in the ground underneath, you know, with the truck roaring through and the bridge up there, they weren't manned or anything. They were remotely run. Uh, couldn't be anybody in, in trouble. And I jumped down out of the cab, as did PJ. We're walking back and down the other end of the war rig is the ladder system to get off the war rig. And they're dragging Janine, that the tall guy. He was actually some kind of a prince, some African prince, um, was on our show. And they were dragging him down. His trousers were torn and blood pouring out everywhere. We said, wow, where, where the hell were you, you know? And these two young kids, a grip and uh, Janine, Janine went up to roll the cameras. He rolled the first one, he ran back to do the second one, decided in his own motivation to stay up there for the run. Didn't tell anybody, nobody knew. And he stayed up. And what he did was he clipped himself, he got into the back behind this camera and he clipped himself onto the Volkswagen. Now, what happened was that the, the last minute, the young grip raced down to check him and took the clip off the Volkswagen and clipped him to the truck on those rails, which saved his life. Because the new driver went under the bridge, too far, the bridge was an angled bridge, and he went under too far to the left and he tore the whole Volkswagen body off. So it ended up smashing on the ground and, and he was actually inside it. So his injuries were this thing tearing off and going past him, but his safety uh, was, was, thank God, was put onto the truck. And that was the only thing that saved him. Um, and it was, George was shattered. We all got a bollocking, and rightly so, because we all should have been checking all the time but who's where, making sure, visually seeing that people are getting off the truck. Because these two young blokes, to you, nah, you'll be right, just roll that, clip you in there, and bang, bang, you'll be right. Um, and it, it's, it just is not done. And it was... Sadly, one of the closest we had, and thank God it didn't go any further than that. There were a couple of other stunty-type injuries. I remember in the early pre-production, a couple of the boys took their motorbikes out into the sand hills of Namibia, and they both came over the top of a sand hill, and there was nothing underneath them, and they just crashed onto the really hard base uh, under the, and they did injuries to their spine, both of them. And I think they're all right. Um, but they were the, basically the only injuries we had. And sadly, the Janine thing was the closest we got to a really bad one. And it and, uh, was lucky that it wasn't any worse than it was. So it was, you know, apropos of saying that it's, it's got some amazing stunts in it, which it has, it was very, very safely handled. But it was just that one moment where you just, you just don't follow things up as well as you should. And even on the comms, listening, PJ, who's adamant about all of that sort of thing, he was comfortable that the boys had gone up, rolled the cameras and got off the truck, which was the arrangement. But they didn't. And nobody saw that they didn't get off the truck because nobody else was up there. So th that was one of the little, little things that can cause a bad accident is that breakdown of, um, of protocol at that particular point of time. And some of the stunts honestly are pretty awesome. When you've got a bloke hanging underneath a truck here, 
um, and these these machines here roaring in and smashing in beside it. Um, here, this is all uh, kind of pre-production trial stuff, just having a look with stunties. Uh, I'm up there with a 5D looking down, which is a shot that we got later from the edge, uh, actually. Um, that edge could do almost everything. It could come over the side and look down, or it could be this side and look down and rotate to get the right rotation. It was just an awesome machine. Um, and it, it did an awful lot of that stuff. But, but even so, uh, stunties uh, clipped onto cables and things underneath there. Your heart's in your mouth a bit because if he came off with those double bogeys back there, there's no way in the world you'd put, no way in the world he'd survive anything. So you always always got that, but they were very very good with their safety. I must say, very good. Just with those uh, five Ds, <coughs> um, did you notice much effect with movement and the rolling shadow in those cameras? Jello effect or anything? I'll be honest, George never worried about it. Um, he. <laughs> He's so fascinating. Uh, he's so interesting because he said, we know what it is, but the people in the Midwest, they haven't got a clue what... what uh, it's a great effect, he said. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to love him. He, he, you know, it's a great effect. That'll be part of the... But, um, <coughs> no, it was there, and, and uh, the, we, were, we were all worried about it, and then the, the visual effects boys were worried, and... Thing. And we got a lot of that banding in the sky <coughs> you know, where, where the uh, digital camera bands and they're replacing a lot of the skies down there and up there wherever it is in Sydney um, to try and get, this, get that banding out of the sky. That's the main thing that's happening. We didn't get that much um, jello effect from the, uh, from the no, shutters. We didn't get a lot. No. no. But what, so the, the visual effects boys cleared the... Canon 5Ds, they were 5D2s initially, uh, so we used them, obviously, but I think in post-production they might have had second thoughts when they found how many shots there were with this banding in the sky that they'd have to replace. So it was expensive to replace the skies with them. But the, uh, John's saying he's going to grunge up, or George is going to grunge up the, the Alexa stuff, that's going to help match it to the, to the Canons, you know, by dumbing down the Alexa. Uh, they'll be a closer match, so we won't be cutting pristine Alexa footage with uh, semi-dodgy 5D footage, you know. They're going to meet somewhere in the middle, hopefully. George's demands in post, uh, one of the visual effects boys told me the other day, has pushed even the data output from an Alexa to the limit. Um, you know, this is where... where George spends a lot of time in post finessing every shot, every frame, practically. And uh, they found that, that the, they're even pushing the Alexa to the limit. So that means that the poor old 5Ds are way behind. And we used Nikons a couple of times, smashed a few of those. But, um, uh, and then we got onto Blackmagic and, and uh, used those a couple <coughs> of times in Sydney. They were good. Um, and the visual effects boys love the output out of a black magic. Um, but it's most interesting to see that uh, visual effects are uh, being pushed to the limit even for an Alexa. Uh, we used that little Movi too, John. Huh? Yeah, the Movi rig, I don't know whether you're familiar with that. That's a whiz of a thing. It's pretty good, aren't they? Yeah, I've used it once. Yeah. Nice, yeah, we had, we had blokes running up and down corridors at Flat Chat and with the little movie out front with a 5D on it. Gosh, it was good stuff. John, you were talking about that, uh, George, you only used a 24, it, it probably your highest one. Right? You a lot of, <coughs> lot of, how was that really in that sort of tracking stuff, that, that, that make-believe tracking? Or, you know? he, yeah, um, the, the 42 minutes we saw... He said to us at the end, he said, what do you reckon the camera speeds are there? And, uh, and I said, oh, maybe about 20. He said, oh, it goes down to about eight frames, you know. So he's manipulating every shot. So most of that's in post. 
obviously. Um, and as I said, he's, he's very critical cutting out of one shot into that one and then out into that one. He's very critical that that flow continues, but the speed <coughs> of change gives all the information in that shot, no matter how long or short it is. So did you overcrank any of the stunts? There was, there was a little bit, but uh, as George mentioned that he hasn't used anything over 24 frames uh, last time I saw him. Oh yeah, like that, yeah. like one of those. Yeah. Um, the, the question I had was, what you thought of it on the on the Russian arm? But you've already answered that. Did you fly it at all? Did you no. Fly it on a wire or no, we flew a Libra, right. banged it into a truck. Um, <laughs> Everything's got to bang into something on this. <laughs> by mistake. Um, but no, we didn't fly the flight head. We had one really, really long. Uh, oh. wire rig through a canyon through past and through all these stalled um, action picture vehicles uh, that was about, oh, I don't know, it must have been 400 yards long, uh, but we used the Libra for that. Right. Yeah, now it worked really well. Mm. They didn't seem to have any trouble on the uh, edge arms with their, <coughs> their equipment. I mean, the bigger Toyota Tundra, the first edge that came out, uh, had a 5.8 inch engine and it blew up. <laughs> um, so they just shipped another one out and fitted it. And there's a very funny story David can tell about. We've got to have a tracking vehicle. So they put the crane on top of the boss's Range Rover. <laughs> yeah. we, we had two, we had two uh, Land Rover Defenders. One was George's and one was Tom Hardy's. One the production company bought and one they rented. So when this, <laughs> vehicle blew up, someone pointed to a Defender and said, OK, let's use that one, but we better use the one we own, not the one, not the one we rent, because we might destroy, you know, damage it a little. So anyhow, they chose the wrong one. So, <laughs> so we, we put the, the edge arm on the, on the rented Defender with suitable holes cut in the panels to get the cables in. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and you know, we're, we're um, hopefully going to do some testing in the next couple of months. Oh, good. Lester will be pleased about that. So he's been using the Libra to date yeah. whenever he uses it. I think he's here this week or next week, I think. But um, he uses the Libra generally. Yeah. But I'm sure he'd be, he's very interested in a flight head. Yeah, mm. sure he is. Mm. It's a good little rig, Lester's. It's not, it hasn't got as long a reach as that. That's 26 feet. I think Lester's reach is 18 feet, right, yeah. I think. Yeah, we've had some, um, some uh, other gyro cameras on there before, but um, yeah, we're, we're talking about the flight head at the moment, getting on there to have a bit of a run around. With right, it, with right. Get out of it. Yeah, well, he's coming down, I think. Uh, hmm. Where does that leave us? Uh, uh, John, sorry, did, did you consider shooting it on a high resolution like, <coughs> Did we? Oh. <laughs> How do I answer that? Harry Raw? Is that what's what? that? Well, is that two K or is that three K? Yeah, I don't know. Like, did you think of red or, or the F sixty five? You know that sort of camera. No. Okay. No. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. As I said, the story is true. I, you know, I'm a Panavision man, and yeah. and. Uh, caught in that situation on a Monday morning at a meeting and suddenly told you're going to go to 2K, I've never shot anything One K. on digital. Half a K. What? Never shot it. Never shot it. <laughs> and so, you know, my only, I could only say, I'm a Panavision man, what have they got? And somebody whispered to Alexis. I said, Alexa, George. <laughs> and um, prepared to go from there. But the Alexa did the job beautifully. I mean, I already knew by reading up... Uh, up that it was a combat proven camera, basically. It had been used in the deserts and cities and it had enough usage to know that it was going to stand up to the rigors of 
of what we would have to put those cameras through. So to me, that's, that's a very big uh, uh, first initial, initial sort of decision making um, criteria that it, it can maintain the distance. I knew the lenses would be all right because I'd be using favourite Panavision lenses, which I could plug into the front of those because it was a Panavision rented Araflex. But, um, so it was almost a done deal. I, I, wouldn't, I didn't even bother going to anything <coughs> else, including reds or anything. I just knew that reds are made by sunglasses. And, and I'd heard too many problems of overheating. And I'd talked to some guys I use in America a lot, first ACs, who were using reds on, on big sh shoots there. And they were going, oh, bloody things overheat, or they do this. They didn't want any of that. I wanted a battle-proven camera. And at that stage, the Alexa was the one. And I'm afraid I would go back to that right away now because of, of that. What about you, Andrew? Yeah. Was, that, was that a yes? What about you? About me, what? <laughs> <laughs> what, would you, what would you go with on you? Come here to hear me. Ah. Because you've used both, haven't you? Yeah, no, yeah. I love Yeah. Which is the new red. Yeah, that Pete Menzies is using. Yeah, he's using that on uh, God's Legion. Yeah. But yeah, Alexis are fantastic. Mm. Okay, that's, you know, the, the company's red. You're reds and they want to give you a, the, the, you've got three of them, they want to give you another body as a backup because they're not 100% yeah. confident if you go out to the desert that you're not going to have something go down. But if you rent Alexis, they have, they, there's no discussion about that at all. These were fantastic. Fantastic. Because mm. it was your f uh, your first time sh shooting that format, did you learn anything from it? Did you, as a, a person from the old days, the old school, <laughs> did you learn <laughs> Did you learn anything? Did you learn anything? <laughs> Some of the coffee's bloody dreadful. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, the coffee was <laughs> no, I mean, you blah, blah, for me, I, I don't know, David probably dabbled in digital before, did you? Before Once, that? once. That um, for me it was uh, just what I'd read and I was trying to keep up with because I was asked to do a, a couple of 3D films or one particular 3D film that, that uh, in the end I couldn't do and somebody else did. And I was desperately trying to catch up with 3D and all its problems and, and whatnot. And, um, but that went away, so I relaxed a bit, never thinking that this would happen. Then all of a sudden, bam, you're thrown into the deep end with digital. Um, and by being honest about the fact that I just said, what's Panavision got and they've got a Lexus, I knew enough to know that Alexis had a proven track record. Um, and learning about them, I just... When you look at that range of guys there, they all knew more about those bloody cameras than I would ever learn. So I just stayed back and said, what's that for? What's that for? What, why would I press that? And they, they'd say, don't press that, or whatever. They knew it. They looked after it and all I did, all I had to do was to, to you know, do what George wanted and set cameras in where George wanted them and maybe cheat a few that he didn't know about. That's all I had to do. They, the boys just, that, that's why they were a fantastic crew. They just took over those cameras and the running of them and the workings of them and, and made sure that they just all kept going. So it was pretty easy, I must say. I sometimes wondered why the hell I was there, but um, <laughs> it, 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 it is a big difference between knowing film and film negative and working that with your metres and your brain, balancing things and going through. You've got a dit man comes up and says, oh, yeah, you're looking all right, shoot that, and you think, well, I don't really know where the exposure is. I haven't really analysed it, do you know what I mean, as you would on film negative. Um, but it didn't matter. Do a fix and post. Became the cry. The cry. So uh, it, it was quite a relaxing way to shoot, actually, I found. And, and if somebody could talk me into doing it again, I'd go the same way. I'd change the coffee, but go the same way. I remember someone saying... The great change for them as a DP was the, the, the split, video split. 
concept came in, things altered dramatically. And the next one, people have said, when the camera developed by the uh, this glasses guy, what's his name? Jim, Jim Janet. Yeah. Yeah. Once that came in, it did alter a lot of working relationship in the, in the industry. So I was just interested to know as a DP from the film days, yeah, the dit man's interesting. He he was the one that shook me. That that part of digital shooting um, came as a uh, you know as a as a new thing. I didn't know anything about a dit man. Suddenly there's this guy with a truck and a tent and telling me what to do. Yeah. And and uh, <laughs> you, you suddenly think, hang on, hold up. Um, so that took me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he, had, you know, he's an interesting man. He had a little machine he'd plug in the back, and he could read, read the thing, couldn't he? The card and everything, and find out if something went. Well, we were dropping frames um, at 60 frames. Well, we wound them up full <coughs> crank because we did do some over cranking stuff. When we did wind it up, it was dropping frames. Uh, when we got to 60 frames, if you hauled back to 50 odd, it wouldn't drop frames. But so that was going, he'd put this thing in the back and did, you know, turn things and looked at little gauges going mad. And, and it never knew what he was doing, but that was that high tech thing that, quite honestly, I'm not interested in. I'd rather, I'm more interested in what the camera's shooting. And as long as those boys can keep a camera recording what the director wants and what we can do for him, that, that's all I'm there for. I, I, don't, I don't want to get involved technically in those things. Um, same with film, uh, you know, I did a film in Central America oh, 25 years ago and, and ended up using high speed negative and decided because we're in a hot sticky jungle I didn't want to be changing <coughs> magazines all the time so I shot the entire picture on the high speed negative. Well I got into so much trouble in America, they couldn't understand that how could you do that? They used to ask me, they'd say, at, at, at little things, they'd say, but you're shooting on a beach at midday with high-speed stock. And I'd say, yeah. And they'd say, but that's designed for night work and low light work. And I'd say, so? It looks great at midday. And I'd say, but how do you... And I'd say, NDs. Just put an 85 ND 12 in and you're down to something like 40 ASA. Good rating for a beach at midday and it looked great. <laughs> so from then on, I never used a slow-speed stock. For the rest of my career, I never, never did it. It was always a high-speed negatives. So I tried to simplify everything about the, the recording of the film. So, you know, I'd go to Panavision. I knew exactly what lenses I thought could do the job. And, you, you know, you, you pulled in specialist lenses that you needed if there was a situation. But otherwise, it was the 11 to 1 zoom and uh, all zooms. Um, and I used to carry just one box of primes, which included super speeds, the old excuse my the expression, but save your ass super speeds. Um, and that's all I carried. And, and uh, you know, studio chiefs couldn't believe how low our camera budget was because I'd have four zooms and that'd be it. And a, bo a box of basic primes and that'd be it. Whereas a lot of American cameramen, if they had four cameras, they'd have four sets of primes, four sets of zooms and the pri the price of that was just ginormous. Whereas I only used to, I used to think if I've got four <coughs> cameras, I'll put three zooms on, four zooms on, and you've, you've got the whole box on each one. Why worry about it, you know? And I've never been, to be honest, very, very worried about the quality of lenses either. I, as long as they're consistent, that's all I ever worried about. Uh, there were days in the early days where you, you colour matched your lenses as well. You know, you test them for colour um, and, and reject them if they were too far out of colour. You don't have to worry about that now. The DI, fix it in the post. You know, you can just click a button and a little bit more blue in that one and whatever, and you've fixed that. So uh, to me it was, I, towards the end, I just handed it over to the first ACs and said, put together those lenses and, and the lenses that suit you the best, the focus puller, because that is the one job, I reckon, left in film that can't be done in post. You can do a little bit, you can do five or seven percent sharpening, but after that you're gone, you're gone. So the focus puller to me is the last man standing 
in a traditional film crew and you've got to help him as much as possible. So I just say to them, we need that, that, that and that and that. Have a look at it and get the best ones that suit you and as long as they're visually compatible to a degree, that's all, I'm, that's all I worry about. After that, let's go make a movie. So the digital thing was the same thing. I found that this dip man, after a while, as I said, when we settled down, we de-rated to 400, he was happier, visual effects were happier, I was still happy with 400 ASA in, in, a, in a, our situations. Simple. Off go and make the movie. So, you know, to me, that's the way I've done it all my, all my life, really, is just kept it all simple. Um, getting bogged down into testing other cameras to get a fraction of a better colour rendition or a fraction of a better grain structure doesn't interest me at all, to be honest. Because I think that the audience, when they sit in the Midwest and they sit there and they look at a movie, the first three shots will tell them what the movie quality is going to be like and then after that they're going to say, give me the story. That's what I paid the money for. It's the story. Not whether I'm looking at the best bloody visual images ever made by man or lens or whatever. They want a story. So to me that's the more important thing. That's why I think, in all honesty, this film, Fury Road, is going to be a cracker. It's, 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 it's going to be, I reckon, one of the the, the best films, it's certainly the best Mad Max film. It goes back to, to, um, to, um, to Road Warrior, the second movie, which was the tanker film. It's a chase film. It goes out into the desert and it comes back. It's got the most amazing uh, stunts, for one. It's got the most amazing characters and it's also got a fantastic um, emotional level to it because we've now got a, 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 a female road warrior. We've got Charlize in there as Furiosa, and she's going to, I think, appeal to uh, a female audience more so because she brings an emotion to it, and it's a very logical emotion. I think it's honed. This script has been honed. <laughs> Sorry, these storyboards have been honed <laughs> <laughs> to a point where uh, I heard that even uh, some of the editing, post-editing boys... Um, we're doing the scene in the desert with the with the Volvolini when they get to the... Oh, it's all top secret, I can't tell you. Um, and they actually shed a tear. They actually said to George, you know, a couple of, couple of the guys shed a tear at that moment. And I thought, fantastic. If that's what a Mad Max action movie can do is bring a tear to the eye of a man, that's, that's I think, going to be a very nicely balanced film. So it's got a lot of fantastic uh, philosophies of life built into it, uh, much more so than the other Mad Max films. There's reasons, and they're very good reasons, as to why Furiosa breaks away and goes into the desert. Um, there's a lot of very logical and good reasons why Max turns them around and brings them back into the fold of the enemy. Um, and they're all very logical and it's all good. It's all good logical level stuff. And I think that's the difference at the moment, you know, between, say, some of the earlier Mad Max, as good as they were, they were fantastic action films. But I think this one's going to be that and more. God damn it, everybody will go and see it. So when do you think it'll be released? May the 15th, 2015. I think that's a lot, uh, it's a big holiday weekend in America. And the reason it's gone back so far is that studios like to select a weekend, a holiday weekend of theirs, that they can say, this is a Mad Max release weekend. Nobody else goes near it. So they have to, they, somebody logs all this. And they were chasing the holiday weekends all the way through 2014, couldn't find one, moved into 2015 and finally found one in May. Uh, so. 15515. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we thought that one out. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it'll be a long time and I think it'll give, you know, the, I think the studio wants a release of the picture by June or July. So, but, the, you know, Talking to them the other day, George is still fiddling. Delivery, delivery. Yeah. George will fiddle. <laughs> well, do we have any uh, just last questions or final questions for John and David? 
Uh, I don't have one. I'm hauling back a little bit uh, and um, and just sort of sort of making my own time at the moment. Uh, it'll have to be pretty damn good to drag me out of out of um, semi retirement, I think. No, I haven't got one on. John, John, did you say you'd worked with George before? Yes, I did a picture called Lorenzo's Oil in uh, Cincinnati uh, years ago. Yeah, George Ogilvy, George Ogilvy right. Beyond Thunderdome. Right. Oh, you did that, yeah. Mm. So, presumably his skills with actors have improved a great deal since then. Yeah, mm. I think he brought George Ogilvy in to help him out in that regard on that film. Mm. What did you do on that film, Dave? Did you second in on that? No, I was only there a few weeks as an additional camera operator. I didn't do the whole picture. So we had a little bit of room, uh, top and bottom, to play with, um, to you know re-rack, but uh, you know taking two three five or two four zero oh out of sixteen by nine one seven eight, um, but yes, yeah, spherical. Because so, those Alexis didn't, they, do they have a four by three sensor? No, I don't think so. No. Okay. I don't know. Well, I'd like to thank uh, David and John for sharing some great Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Alan. Oh, Alan. Alan. something for you. Thank you very much. Yeah, very yeah. kind of you. Um, I can hardly wait to see it. I mean, uh, it sounds fantastic. But uh, thanks very much, John and David, for coming down and being so generous with your time. Fantastic. Fantastic. Night.